Hello, my name is Dr. Teresa Bacon Bagley. I am a professor in the College of Health Professions at Grand Valley State University. Today we're going to look at mild traumatic brain injury or concussion and the diagnosis. We're going to look at some of the tools that are used to diagnose traumatic brain injury as well as the potential use of scanning and laboratory tests. Now the objectives for this module is that by the end you should be able to identify tools used to diagnose a concussion at the time of injury and at time of post deployment. And some of you may be very familiar with these as you have had to use these. In addition, we'll discuss when scanning and laboratory tests are done after a traumatic brain injury. There are a variety of factors that are considered in the diagnosis and treating of a injury to the brain. Remember that there are a variety of types of traumatic brain injury. A few modules ago, we learned that there are mild, which is your concussion type of injury. Then there's moderate, severe, and there's also penetrating injuries. Depending on the type of injury will also depend on the diagnostic tools used. For example, in penetrating injuries, you're more likely to see scanning used to determine exactly what part of the brain has been penetrated. Also what goes into play in the diagnosis and treatment of TBI is the injury stage. The treatment is different in the acute stage, which is within seven days, which is less than seven days after the injury. Then there's subacute, which is greater than seven days. And then there's chronic injury, which requires a whole different set of treatment modalities. Also, which needs to be taken into consideration in the diagnosing and treatment is the level of care. The diagnosis in theater might be different than the diagnosis in the community. Also the diagnosis and treatment of TBI is dependent upon the level of care. In other words, the diagnostic tools used in theater right after an injury might be different than the diagnostic tool used in the community. Other things that make a difference in the diagnosing and the treatment are whether or not the care is in the continental U.S. or CONUS, whether it is inpatient, whether it's outpatient, or whether it's a community-based type of treatment. So as you can see by this slide, a variety of different issues come into play in the diagnosing and treatment, that being the type of injury, whether or not it's acute, subacute, or chronic, and where that care is being received. Now I'm going to go over the different military levels of care. And again, some of you may be familiar with this. If you look at the lower part of the arrow on this slide, you can see four levels of care. There's the battalion aid station level one. There's the forward surgical team, which is level two. And there's the combat support hospital level three and there's the definitive care, which is level four. Let's just kind of review some of those. Level one is the first medical care that a soldier receives, which includes immediate life-saving measures, may include injury prevention, combat stress control preventative measures, evacuation from units to supporting medical treatment, the major emphasis is placed on those measures necessary to return the patient to duty or to stabilize him or her for medical evacuation to the next level, which would be level two. Level two, or the forward surgical team of care, includes evacuating patients from level one, and at this level the patient is examined, wounds, illnesses, and general status are evaluated, and he or she is reacted and returned to duty or they are continued along the level of medical care and evacuated to level three. This level of care, level two, also has expanded services such as dental, laboratory, x-ray, as well as patient holding capabilities. 
Level three or combat support hospital level is for patients who require immediate surgical care as close to the division rear boundary as the situation will allow. The facilities there are greater than level two. Level four provides specialized medical and surgical care, provides hospitalization for general classes of patients, and reconditioning and rehabilitation services for those patients who can return to duty within the theater evacuation policy. The majority of patients within the facility are in the rehabilitation category. This level, level four, serves as the primary conduit for patient evacuations to the continental U.S. Although it's not identified on this slide, there is a level five which includes the continental U.S. hospitals, which are staffed and equipped for most of the definitive care that's available within the system. So there's these four levels of care based on location and severity of injury. You can see on the upper portion of the slide, there are some goal timelines that have been established. And that is that evacuation, if somebody needs to be evacuated from level one to level two, the goal is that that's done within an hour. If someone needs to go to level three, the goal is within 24 hours that that person is in that level of care. And if someone needs level four, the goal is that within 48 to 72 hours after injury, that individual is at that facility. Those are goals established by the Department of Defense. There have been a lot of research done on the evidence-based diagnosis for a traumatic brain injury within the military population. Now in a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, the United States Central Command, CENTCOM, really established the cornerstones of treatment. The cornerstones are listed here on this slide. They are to protect from further injury to the brain, to provide medications for symptomatic relief, to provide education stressing the possible expectations to full recovery, and to follow the recovery course and return to deployment. There are also guidelines that are established for the treatment of a concussion. There are the acute treatment guidelines, which are the OSD HA clinical guidance, that needs to be established in order to diagnose someone with a mild traumatic brain injury. And then there's the subacute guidelines and the chronic guidelines, which have been established by the Department of Defense and the VA. This is a very, very intensely researched area that has provided very specific guidelines. This was released in 2009, and it is quite encompassing of any type of symptom that one could expect after a concussion. There are also guidelines that are used to treat moderate and severe and penetrating traumatic brain injury, and those are listed in the table on the right-hand side. Not expecting you to know these, but they're just referenced there that there are specific guidelines that are based on research showing the best possible treatment that would result in the best possible outcome. There are the guidelines for the management of severe traumatic brain injury that have been established by the Brain Trauma Foundation. There's also field management of combat-related head trauma that have been established, as well as surgical management for TBI and also guidelines for the pharmacologic treatment of neurobehavioral sequelae and the nursing management of adults with severe TBI. Now let's go back and look at what actually is done after someone has sustained a concussion. What is involved in the diagnosis of that condition? Well, the initial thing is that there should be acute evaluation. Right after being exposed to a blast force, there should be an evaluation that involves a neurologic assessment, that's an assessment of the brain and how it works, as well as a mental status testing. 
Let's look at what's involved in both of those. Now the neurological exam involves a mini mental exam, which really looks at if the individual is alert oriented, are they aware of their surroundings? There's the cranial nerve testing, which looks at the nerves that come off your brain stem as well as nerves in your brain to see if they're functioning correctly. There's muscle tone testing, there's reflex testing, there's strength testing of the muscle, and there's postural stability, the ability to maintain your balance. In addition, in the physical exam, there's the vision test. As we went over before, many blast-related injuries can result in problems to the eyes and the nerves that allow us to see things. Vision acuity refers to the ability to identify letters. You've seen these on charts where you've had to identify letters, an A and a C and an F, or you've had the letter E positioned in different ways, pointing upwards, to the right, to the left, or down. That's the acuity test. The other vision test is the binocular function and visual fields test. This looks at whether or not you can see things in the center of your visual field as well as those things that are in the peripheral portion of your visual field. In addition to the physical exam, there's also the musculoskeletal exam that actually is an in-depth look at whether or not the nerves in your muscles are working correctly as well as the muscles themselves. Now I'm going to go over a few red flags that kind of signal there might be something else going on when somebody's exposed uh, to a blast injury or any type of force resulting in a concussion. I've highlighted some ones that are more prevalent that indicate that some other damage may be occurring. The red ones are an altered consciousness. A good example of this is when an individual is alert and oriented, but all of a sudden becomes sleepy and difficult to arouse. Another red one that's identified here are seizures. If a patient that has a concussion all of a sudden starts to have seizure activity, then further investigation needs to be done. Worsening headache is also a red flag, as well as unsteadiness, balance issues. I won't read through the rest of these, but you can look at those on your own time. We went over what needs to be done initially after sustaining a traumatic brain injury or concussion. We went over a neurologic exam. We went over the vision exam. We kind of briefly mentioned the musculoskeletal exam, but there are also some evaluation tools that are used in that acute situation. So the acute evaluation instruments that are typically used in the military are the Standard Assessment of Concussion Tool, the SAC, that was adopted by the Department of Defense in 2006. And then there's the Military Acute Concussion Evaluation Scale, the MACE. Now the major components of the standardized assessment of concussion include orientation to your environment, to yourself, the date, year, etc., immediate memory, it also involves the ability to concentrate by listing back letters or numbers. In addition, delayed recall and neurological screening is done with this tool, as well as exertional maneuvers. The exertional maneuvers refer to the ability to conduct physical activity, such as the sit-ups, such as push-ups, knee bends, uh, quick sprinting. There's an additional portion to the standardized assessment of concussion referred to the addendum. This is not always used in the military, but it actually adds more information to the symptoms someone is having after being exposed to a blast injury or any other injury resulting in a injury to the brain. The symptom checklist, as you can see, is a variety of symptoms, whether or not they're present or not. There also is a section on amnesia, which looks at post-traumatic amnesia, 
as well as retrograde amnesia, as well as a neurological exam looking at muscle strength in the legs, as well as the ability to carry on movement to the body through walking or sprinting. The other tool that the military uses is the MACE. This is the Military Acute Concussion Evaluation. Three major components of this evaluation tool exist. The first evaluation component is the history as well as the symptoms of the uh, injury. Then there's a screening neurological exam as well as a cognitive screen. Remember, cognition refers to the ability to think through things. Add two plus two. Interpret something that is read. In many situations, one of these tools are used in the diagnosis, either the SAC or the MAC, and some people actually use both of them to evaluate a traumatic brain injury. There's a few other tools that are used by the Department of Defense, just in case you've been exposed to some of those. One is the Automated Neuropsychological Assessment Metrics. This actually is used by the Army, and it's been used for a few decades. There's the Cognitive Stability Index, the CSI. Again, this is primarily used in the Air Force. And then there's the R-bands, the Repeated Battery for Assessment of Neuropsychological Status. Again, all these tools that are used have been validated tools. In other words, they do pick up traumatic brain injury in individuals that have sustained injury. Now we went over the tools that are used right after an injury is sustained. There are also tools used by the military to detect whether or not somebody has had a previous traumatic brain injury. Those are the post-deployment instruments. There are two major tools that are used. There's a post-deployment health assessment, which is an online questionnaire. This has questions that actually pick up whether or not somebody has been exposed to a situation resulting in a traumatic brain injury. So it's a screening for the history of traumatic brain injury. There's also a tool, it's referred to as the three question DVBIC screening tool, which is shown on this slide. Three questions that actually look at whether or not somebody's been exposed to a situation resulting in traumatic brain injury. Many individuals coming home have been exposed to these tools in order to pick up an injury that may not have been recognized in theater. This is a very important tool as it can provide information that will result in the treatment of an individual that has a traumatic brain injury. Now this last section of this module looks at neuroimaging and laboratory testing. So neuroimaging, what's, what's referred to in neuroimaging is the MRI scanning or the CT scanning. Usually these scans are normal in a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion. And a review of the literature shows that in most cases, a CT scan is not used to diagnose a concussion as it's usually normal. So those individuals that are screened to have a concussion and not a moderate or severe traumatic brain injury, those individuals will usually have a normal CT scan, so it's not necessarily required. In some cases, the imaging is used to eliminate other medical conditions that may be going on, such as any bleeding or tumors. Now one may wonder, well, what's the difference between a CT and an MRI? Even though they pick up similar pieces of information, the CT scan is the test of choice for use in an emergency department. Anything that would require surgery is visible on a CT scan, and therefore it is the scan of choice. The MRI is typically used if somebody has persistent post-traumatic types of sequelae or manifestations. The Department of Defense recommendation on imaging is that it is not recommended 
beyond the emergency phase. And again, I wanna stress this is for mild traumatic brain injury or a concussion, not for moderate or severe traumatic brain injury. Symptoms that indicate acute neurological conditions may warrant imaging if necessary. For example, if someone had a concussion, but all of a sudden had seizures, then that may warrant a scan to be done. But if no symptoms occurred, or red flags, then scanning may not be necessary. So when are laboratory tests done? They're really not recommended to confirm or manage a mild traumatic brain injury. However, they may be necessary for non-traumatic brain injury causes for the symptoms. For example, if somebody has a bleed, then maybe blood tests to look at whether or not they bleed too quickly might be warranted. There is some research showing that there are potential biomarkers for a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. Those are only currently being investigated. However, sometime in the future, we may see blood tests being done to determine whether or not a concussion has occurred. This is the end of the module that talked about the diagnosis of traumatic brain injury. The take home message for this module is that there are a variety of different diagnostic tools used. There's the physical exam, and then there's all those diagnostic tools that are used that ask questions, the questionnaires, the MACE, the SAC, etc. So there's a variety of tools used to make the diagnosis, as well as the physical exam. In addition, Scanning or neuroimaging is not always necessary for a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion. And laboratory tests, unless there's other manifestations going on or worsening conditions, are usually not done in a patient that has a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury. Thank you.